Wild Oat Tube. Today we have The Defense of the Sentinel um, by Louis L'Amour. So this one was originally published, I think it was said 1952 in Western Novels Magazine, which means it's in the public domain and it's only eight pages long. So I thought we would just read it. Now if you want, um, I, I will put a link down below to a free PDF that I found if you want to stop and read it for yourself. Stop this video and then read it for yourself. Probably be a lot less painful because it's late and I can barely talk. So um, I do have a half glass of cold water here. And we're going to do our best. So if you don't want to go read the PDF, you just want to listen to the video. Awesome. Here, here we are. Now, if you want a legitimate copy that's not in the public domain, but you want to actually pay for it, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can use my affiliate link down below to bookshop.org to get this copy of Louis L'Amour. And if you go there and buy this book or any other book, I get a small commission and you get an awesome book at no extra cost to yourself. It's awesome. It's a win-win. So the defense of the Sentinel. <laughs> When the morning came, I'm going to have to turn on the overhead light for this one. I, I need all the light I can get. I'm still reading in a shadow. When the morning came, Finn Mc, McGraw awakened into a silent world. His eyes opened to the wide and wandering sky where a solitary cloud wandered reluctantly across the endless blue. At first, he did not notice the silence. He had awakened his mouth tasted like rain-soaked cat hide. Gross. He wanted a drink, and he needed a shave. This is not an unusual situation. He heaved himself to a sitting position, yawned widely, scratching his ribs, and became aware of the silence. No sound, no movement, no rattling of well buckets, no rattling of well buckets, no crackling of hens, no slamming of doors, sentinel, was a town of silence. Slowly his mind filling with wonder, Finn McGraw climbed to his feet with 50 wasted years behind him. He had believed the world held no more surprises, but Sentinel was empty. Sentinel, where for six months Finn McGraw had held the unenvied position of official town drunk, he had been the tramp, the vagabond, the useless, the dirty, dusty, unshaven, whiskey, sodden, drunk. He slept in alleys, he slept in barns, wherever he happened to be when he passed out. Finn McGraw was a man without a home, without a job, without a dime, and now he was a man without a town. What can be more pitiful than, than a townless town drunk? Carefully, McGraw got to his feet, the world tipped edgewise and he balanced delicately and managed to maintain his equilibrium negotiating the placing of his feet with extreme caution he succeeded in crossing the wash and stumbling up the bank on his on the town side again more ap apprehensively he listened Silence. No smoke rising from chimneys, no barking dogs, no horses. The street lay empty before him, like a street in a, ghost, in a town of ghosts. Finn McGraw paused and stared at the phenomenon. Had he liked Rip Van Winkle, slept for 20 years? He, yet he hesitated for, well, he knew the extreme lengths the, that western man would go for a pra good practical joke. The thought came as a relief that when it, when it was, of course, this was a joke, they all had gotten together to play a joke on him. His footsteps echoed hollow, hollowly on the boardwalk, tentatively. He tried the door of the saloon. It gave inward, and he pushed by the inner bat-wing door, looked around. The odor of stale whiskey mingled with cigar smoke lingered, lingered lonesomely, in the air. Poker chips and cards were scattered on the table, but there was nobody, nobody at all. The back bar was lined with bottles, his face brightened, brightened whiskey, good whiskey, and, it, and his for the taking, at least if they had deserted him, they had left the whiskey behind. Caution intervened. He walked to the back office and pushed, 
opened the door, it creaked on its rusty hinges and gave inward to emptiness. Hey! His voice found only an echo for company. Where is everybody? No answer. He walked to the door and looked out upon the street. Suddenly, the desire for human companionship blossomed into a vast yearning. He rushed outside. He shouted. His voice rang em empty, emptily. Emptily. I'm, it sounds like I'm saying that weird. I probably am saying that weird. In the street, against the false fronted buildings, wildly, he rushed from door to door. The blacksmith shop, the livery stable, the saddle shop, the boot maker, the general store, the jail, all were empty, deserted. He was alone. Alone! What had happened? What? Well, where was everybody? Saloons full of whiskey, stores filled with food, blankets, clothing. All these things have been left unguarded. Half frightened, Finn McGraw made his way to the restaurant. Everything there was as if it had been left. A meal half eaten on the table, dishes unwashed, but the stove was cold. Aware suddenly of a need for, for strength that whiskey could not provide, Finn McGraw kindled a flame in the stove from a huge ham he cut. Several thick slices. He went out back and rummaged through the nest and found a few scattered eggs. He carried these inside and prepared a meal. With a good breakfast under his belt, he refilled his coffee cup and rummaged around until he found a box of cigars. He struck a match and lighted a good Havana, pocketing Cuban suck. Cuban cigars. Out. The Cuban, the people, I'm sure are lovely. There's not many of those in, in, in rural Illinois, but the Cuban cigars. Pocketing several more. Then he, he leaned back and began to consider the situation. Despite the excellent meal and the cigar, he was uneasy. The heavy silence worried him, and he got up and went cautiously to the door. Suppose there was something there, here, something malign and evil. Suppose angrily he pushed the door open. He was going to stop supposing. For the first time in his life, he had a town of everything, and he was going to make the most of it. Sauntering carelessly, carelessly down the empty street to the elite general store, he entered the coolie. Be, he entered, and coolly began examining the clothing. He found a hand-me-down gray suit and changed his clothes. He selected new boots and donned them as well, as a white cambric shirt, a black string tie, and a new black hat. He pocketed a fine linen handkerchief. Next, he lighted another cigar, spat into the brass spittoon, and looked upon life with favor. On his right, as he turned to leave the store, was a long rack of rifles, shotguns, and pistols. Thoughtfully, he studied them. In, a, in his day, that was 30 years ago or so, he had been a sharpshooter in the army. He got down a Winchester 73, an excellent weapon, and loaded it with 17 bullets. He appreciated, he appropriated a fine pair, pair of Colts, loaded them and belt them on, filling the loops with cartridges. Taking down a shotgun, he loaded both barrels with, with buckshot. Then he sauntered down to the saloon, rummaged under the bar until he came up with Dennis... Magoon's excellent Irish whiskey and poured three fingers into a glass. Admiring the brown, beautiful color, the somber amber was as he liked to call it. He studied the sunlight through the glass, then he tasted it. Ah, now that was something like it. There was a taste of bog in that. He taste he tossed he tossed off his drink and refilled the glass. The town was his, the whole town, full of whiskey, clo food, clothing, almost everything a man could want. But why? Where was everybody? Thoughtfully, he walked outside. The silence held sway. A lonely dust devil danced on the prairie outside of town, and the sun was warm. At the edge of town, he looked out over the prairie towards the mountains. Nothing met his eyes save a vast, unbelievable, unbelievable sketch stretch of grassy plain oi 
His eyes dropped to the dust, and with a kind of shock, he remembered that he could read sign. That he could read sign. Huh. Here were the tracks of a half dozen rigs, buckboards, wagons, and carts from the horse tracks. All were headed the same direction, east. He scowled, and turning thoughtfully, he walked back to the livery barn. Not a horse remained. Bits of harness were dropped on the ground. A spare saddle. Everything showed evidence of a sudden and hasty departure. An hour later, having made the rounds, Finn McGraw returned to the saloon. He poured another glass of the Irish lighted glass of the Irish, lighted another Havana, but now he had a problem. The people of the town had not vanished into thin air. They had made a sudden frightened panic stricken stricken rush to get away from this place. That implied there was in the town itself some evil. Finn McGraw tasted the whiskey and looked over his shoulder uncomfortably. He tiptoed to the door, looked one way, then suddenly at the other. Nothing unusual met his gaze. He tasted the whiskey again and then crawled and then crawling from the dusty and cobweb convolutions of his brain, along befuddled by alcohol came realization. Indians! He remembered some talk the night before while he was trying to hum, bum a drink. The latter five ranch had been raided and the hands had been murdered. Victoria was on the warpath, burning, killing, maiming, Apaches! The fort was east of here. Some messages must have come, some words, some, and the inhabitants had fled like sheep and left behind left him behind like a breath of icy air he realized that he was alone in the town there was no means of escape no place to hide and the apaches are coming thrusting the bottle of irish into his pocket finn mcgraw made a break for the door outside he rushed down to the elite general store this building was of stone low and squat and built for defense as it had been a trading post and a stage station before the town grew up around it. Hastily, he took stock. Moving flower barrels, he rolled them to the door to block it. Atop the barrels, he placed sacks and bales of boxes. He barred the heavy back door and blocked the windows. He, the, he In the center of the flower, he built a circular par parapet of more sacks and barrels for at least defense, for a last defense. He got down an, unar an armful of shotgun and proceeded. Oh my lord, I am butchering this now. He got down an armful of shotguns and proceeded to load the load ten of them. These he scattered around at various loopholes with a stack of shells by each. Then he loaded several rifles: three Spencer 56s, a Sharp 50, and a Winchester 73. He loaded a dozen of the Colts and opened boxes of ammunition. Then he lighted another Havana and settled down to wait. The morning was well nigh gone. There was food enough in the store and the position was a commanding one. The store was thrust out from the line of buildings in such a way that it commanded the approaches of the street in both directions. Yet, it was long enough so that it could command the rear of the building as well. By running to the back, the more he studied his position, the more he wondered why Sentinel inhabitants had left town Undef undefended. Only blind, unreasoning panic could have caused such a fight. Flight. At noon, he prepared himself a meal from what he found in the store and waited. It. It was shortly after high sun when the Indians came. The Apaches might have been scouting the place for hours. Finn had not seen them. Now they came cautiously down the street, creeping hesitantly along. From a window that commanded the street, old Finn McGraw waited on the window sill. He had four shotguns, each with two barrels loaded with buckshot, and he waited. The Apaches, suspecting a trap, approached cautiously. They peered into empty buildings, flattened their fa faces against windows when they came on. The looting would follow later. Now the Indians were suspicious, anxious to know 
The town was deserted. They crept forward. Six of them bunched to talk some 40 yards away. Beyond them, a half dozen more Apaches were scattered in the next 20 yards. Sighting two of his shotguns, Finn McGraw rested a hand on each. The guns were carefully held in place by sacks weighing them down, and he was ready. He squeezed all four triggers at once. The concussion was terrific. With a frightful roar, the four barrels blasted death into the little group of Indians. And instantly, McGraw sprang to the next two guns, swung one of them slightly, and fired again. Then he grabbed a heavy Spencer and began firing as fast as he could aim, getting off four shots before the street was empty, empty but for the dead. Five Apaches lay stretched on the street, another dragging himself with his hands was attempting to escape. McGraw lunged to his feet and raced to the back of the building. He caught a glimpse of an Indian and snapped a quick shot. The Apache dropped, stumbled to his feet. Then he fell and lay still. That was the beginning all through the, the long hot afternoon. The battle waged. Finn McGraw drank whiskey and swore. He loaded and reloaded the battery of guns. The air and the store was stifling. The heat increased. The store smells thickened. And over it all hung an acrid smell of gunpowder. Patches came to recover their dead and died beside them. Two naked warriors tried to cross the rooftops of the building and dropped them both. One lay on the blistering roof while the other rolled off and fell heavily. Sweat trickled in McGraw's eyes. And his face became swollen from the kick of the guns. From the front of the store, he could watch th three ways, and a glance down the length of the store allowed him to see a very limited range outside. Occasionally, he took a shot from the back window, hoping to keep them guessing. Night came at last, bringing a blessed coolness, and old Finn McGraws relaxed and put aside his guns. Who can say that he knows the soul of the Indian? Who can say what dark superstitions churn inside his skull? For no Apache will fight at night since he believes the souls of the men killed in darkness must forever wander homeless and alone. Was it fear that prevented an attack now or was it some fear of the strange many-weaponed man? If man he was who occupied the dark stone building. And who can say with that strange expression... They stared at each other as they heard from their fires outside. The town was weird thunder of the old piano in the saloon. The old man's whiskey brass rolling out the words of the whirring of the green drill. Each terrier's drill come where my love lies dreaming in Shenandoah. Day came and found Finn McGraws in the store ready for battle. The old lust for battle that is... The brightest of the Irish had risen within him. Never from this moment he realized that he was alone in town, about to be raided by Apaches. Had he given himself a chance for survival, yet it was the way of the Irish to fight, the way even of old whiskey soaked thin. An hour after dawn, a bullet struck him in the side. He spun half around, fell against the flour barrels, and slid to the floor. Blood flowed from the sash, and he caught up and he caught up a handful of flour and slapped it against the wound. Promptly, he sh fired a shot from the door, an aimless shot, to let them know he was still there. Then he bandaged his wound. It was a flesh wound, merely a flesh wound, and would have bled badly but for the flour. Sweat trickled into his eyes. Grime and powder smoke streaks his face, but he moved and moved again, and his shotguns and rifles stopped every attempt to approach the building. Even looting at, was at a minimum, for he controlled most of the entrances, and the Apaches soon found they must dispose of their enemy before they could profit from this town. Sometime in the afternoon, a bullet knocked him out, cutting a furrow in his scalp. And it was nearing dusk when his eyes opened. His head throbbed with enormous pain. His mouth was dry. He rolled to a sitting position and took a long pull at the Irish, feeling for a shotgun. 
and Apache was even then fumbling at the door. He steadied the gun against the corner of the box. His eyes blinked. He squeezed off both barrels and hit in the belly. The Apache staggered back. At high noon on the fourth day, Major Magruder, with a troop of cavalry, rode into the streets of Sentinel. Behind him were 60 men of the town, all armed with rifles. At the edge of town, Major Magruder lifted a hand. Jake Carter and Dennis Magoon moved up beside him. I thought you said this town was deserted. His extended finger indicated a dead Apache. Their horses walked slowly forward. Another Apache sprawled, were dead. they're dead. And then they found another. Before the store, four Apaches lay in a tight cluster. Another savage was stretched at the side of the walk. Windows of the store were shattered and broken. A great hole had been blasted in, in the door. At the Major's orders, the troops scattered to search the town. McGruder swung down before the store. I'd take an oath nobody was left behind, Carter said. McGruder shoved open the door, the store. The floor inside was littered with blackened cartridges, cases, and strewn with empty bottles. No man could fire that many shells or drink that much whiskey, Magruder said positively. He stooped, looking at the floor and some flour on the floor blood, he said. In the saloon, they found another empty bottle and an empty box of cigars. Magoon stared dis dismay dismally? dismally? At the empty bottles, he had been keeping count, and all but three of the bottles of his best Irish glory were gone. Whoever it was, he said sorrowfully, drank up some of the best whiskey he ever brewed. Carter looked at the piano suddenly and grabbed McGoon's arm. McGraw, he yelled. "'Twas Finn McGraw. They looked at each other, and, and it couldn't be. And yet, who had seen him? Where was he now? Who, Magruder asked, is McGraw? They explained, and the search continued. Bullets had clipped the corner of the building. Bullets had smashed water barrels along the streets. Windows were broken, and there were 19 dead Indians with no sign of McGraw. Then a soldier yelled from outside of town, and they went that way and gathered around under the edge of the mesquite bush. A shotgun beside him in a new suit, torn and blood-stained, they found Finn McGraw. Beside him lay two empty bottles of Irish, another partly gone, lay near his hand. A rifle was propped in the forks of the bush, and a pistol had fallen from this holster. There was blood on his side and blood on his head and face. Dead, Carter said. But what a battle. Magruder bent over, the old man. Then he looked up, a faint twinkle breaking the gravity of his face. Dead, all right, he said. Dead, drunk. Defense of the Sentinel. That was a good one. I like that one. It was kind of funny. Uh, I mean, funny and with a lot of murder, but I enjoyed that one. It was a good one. It was it was a banger. I call, I call that one a banger. What did you think of it? Did you read it? Did you stop the video and uh, go read the free PDF that I have linked down below? Did you go buy this book yet? Great. Only one dud so far in this entire book. And we're, you know, halfway through about almost. So that's it for this one, peeps. Tomorrow, tomorrow's one that we read last, I read last year, the one for the Mojave Kid. It's not in the public domain, and it's a little bit on the long side. I kind of feel like maybe reading it. I don't know. We'll see. I might just reread it and talk about it. Uh, it's uh, 15 pages, so it's twice as long as this one. This video already went 24 minutes long. So it'd be, it'd be a long one. We'll see. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see how... Uh, how uh, how I'm feeling tomorrow after some sleep. That's it for this one, peeps. Cheers.